What then is the purpose of positive emotion? Why do we have positive emotion when we've concentrated so much on fight-flight ideas and theories of fight-flight and negativity? What is the purpose of positive emotion? Why has positive emotion evolved? Why has positive emotion lasted through evolution? It's something that has lasted forever and ever. We've continued to have it. It has continued to propagate itself in one way or another. So really, what does positive emotion do? Does it have, and this is the crucial question that we need to answer, is does positive emotion have a crucial evolutionary purpose? Is it crucial to our evolving as a species? Is it crucial to our evolving as an individual? Let's go back to the negative side of this and we'll get a look at what we're up against in terms of, of the sort of lean towards the negative. How much we love the negative. Even though we think we may not love the negative, as you go through this experience with me, you're going to be more and more aware of the places and the ways where you're, you'll, you'll find you have some character strengths and the op opposite of those are character weaknesses. And those character weaknesses, which comprise your ego, love to swing and lean towards the negative. They love to take you towards the negative because if they can't do it, they won't be fed. Those neurons in your brain won't be fed. They won't get oxygen. They won't get glucose. They will die. So they have an investment to get you to lean. Your ego has an investment to get you to lean towards the negative. And we've got to change that around and we've got to get you the propensity of you and the probability of you to lean towards the positive, to start the positive lean. And it's going to be like getting a snowball moving. And you're going to come back and complain, oh, I only got a 40 on my up spiral. I'm only at a 45 and I'm only at a 55. As we struggle back and forth with these learned patterns that, that we have. Now, why do we have them? One of the, the most important insights into the positive mind or growing the positive mind comes from someone who studied its opposite, which was why do we have such a negative mind. Only this person is a woman by the name of Zygarnik who studied why people would follow Stalin. She worked for Stalin and she used funds from Stalin's government to do an exhaustive study. She's a brilliant evolutionary sociologist and statistician. And she asked the question, why would people follow Stalin? What is it about us that would get us to cheat on our neighbors and lie and do the things that upheld the Stalinist state. And what in psychology is known today is, is the Zygarnik effect as a result of her work. Now the Zygarnik effect says this very disturbing piece of information. And that is because of the way we have evolved from getting away from the tiger that would chase us or from whatever would threaten us as, as cave people from having to use our fight-flight response for so long in our evolution, for being so evolutionary conditioned by that fight-flight response, by having to protect ourselves in order to stay alive, that we are inclined to go to the negative nine times more than towards the positive. It is a nine to one ratio. We're more likely to remember the negative than the positive nine to one. Now let me give you a, a little test of that. Somebody tells you, you have re really lovely hair. You have beautiful, soft, lovely hair. You have such deep, deep eyes. I love the color of your eyes. And those earlobes you have, <laughs> ah, just, just really so good to nibble on those, those earlobes. And your neck, have I told you about your neck? Let me tell you about your neck. And just the whole shape of of your body and in your skin, your skin is so soft. What, what do you do to keep your skin so lovely and so soft? And I love your feet. Just Your feet are just really sexy. Now, I don't have a foot fetish, but those feet of yours are just really terrific. Your butt's a little too big, but uh, all the rest is fine. 
Now, I doubt if somebody told you that, you would be feeling the softness of your skin. You probably would be doing something like this. <laughs> At least when you got home. <laughs> My guess is that what we would remember is not all those, one yeah, there's, yeah, there's all those wonderful things. Of course, all the, but he does he really think my butt is that big? <laughs> is it? Is it really? And we would, if, if we spent, uh, looked at the amount of time we spent in front of the mirror, checking out which part we checked out, it probably wouldn't be any of the positive things. And we've been conditioned like that through school. It wasn't so much that I might have gotten 95 things correct on a test. What really bugged me was that I got five things wrong. And I was even told, as many of you were told, well, why did you miss the five things? Why didn't you, why, why did you get, you got seven A's, why did you get this C? I always got C's in conduct. <laughs> seven, seven A's and C's in conduct, and they focused right in on the C in conduct. Well, we've grown up in a culture where we have really believed that what is important is the well-rounded person. And to have a well-rounded, well-balanced person boring as they are. <laughs> you have to raise up the weaknesses. You have to balance the weaknesses. You have to balance the deficits. And now we're going in just the opposite, realizing that uh, we don't really, we're, what, we're not, what we're after here is not well-balanced people, necessarily. We're not after well-rounded people, uh, because when we are after that kind of roundedness, we ignore what is positive and good and best, and we waste a great deal of time focusing on the negative because we're going to find that what you focus on is what you get. Where you shine the light is what you get more of. We've spent years and years and years in educational systems that are largely characterized by negativity. Once in a while we had one teacher, one professor, one person who found our strength or found who was, what was good with us and nurtured us in terms of what was good with us and, and what was was a strength in us and we grew. But we have a profound attention given to the negative side of what life is. We would be stuck with this uh, Zygarnik effect. I mean, here we are in a class that's concerning positivity and growing the positive mind and what it takes to develop the skills to do that. And the first thing I confront you with is that we're up against this statistic there is a nine to one probability that you will swing to the negative rather than the positive. Now just maybe in this new millennium that seems to hold so much promise, perhaps in this new millennium there's some emerging research that shows us that we can offset and begin to change that nine to one propensity. And I'm here to tell you that we can and that in this class and others, others like it that we do at a and &I, uh, we change that propensity. And one of the secrets of doing that is what we're discovering about the brain, and that is neuroplasticity. That your brain is not fixed. That your brain, it isn't just that this part does this, and this part does this, and this part does this, and this part does that, but that your brain is always growing. That, I don't know if you knew this or not, a lot of people don't, but we thought for a while we'd made a wonderful discovery when we discovered that adolescents still are growing new brain cells from 20 to 25. That their development wasn't over. But guess what else we found out later? And that is that you are all, until the end of your life, growing new brain cells. We are all growing these new cells, and particularly new brain cells. Not only that, but what neuroplasticity means is simply this. What you think about and what you feel is what you are going to build in your brain. 